Okay. Okay, I would like welcome to welcome everyone to the University of Łódź. It's my pleasure to host you. Thank you for your joining this workshop that is part of the European Universities Association workshop series on the topic National Perspectives on Reforming Research Assessment. A very special welcome uh, to representatives from CRASP, the National Science Center, Polish Young Academy from the Polish Academy of Sciences, and also from over 30 Polish universities and higher education institutions who are here with us, either in person or online. My name is Elżbieta Rządzińska, and I am rector of the University of Łódź and president of CRASP Science Committee. It's my great pleasure to introduce our key speakers today, our excellent key speakers today, Dr. Stefan Bergmans, Director of Research and Innovation at the European University Association, and Professor Marcin Powis, former rector of the University of Warsaw, president of CRASP European Networks of Universities Group and, University and European University Association board member. Today's workshop will focus on the national perspective on reforming research assessment. Uh, we hope that this event will raise further awareness at national level on the agreement on reforming research assessment and the creation of the coalition explore and discuss the opportunities and challenges at national level of this initiative. And now just a little housekeeping before we get started to our online uh, participants. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your click meeting control panel. We will answer them during the open floor question and answer session. Uh, now let me invite our first speaker, Professor Marcin Powis, who will give a talk on the topic research assessment reform in the national context and development of the agreement and coalition. Mr. Pre Mr. Professor Powis, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Zandzińska. It's my pleasure, my great pleasure to start uh, with the first presentation during this uh, workshop. And uh, this is uh, about the discussing reforming assessment, uh, research assessment in Poland and in Europe. And the idea uh, here is that we do not only share the information on the developments, but we also share our thoughts and uh, the ideas about uh, how to uh, address the challenge of the research assessment in the best possible way. In the, today's uh, uh, workshop, we have uh, the first part is the uh, introduction, then uh, there will be uh, information on the agreement uh, on the research, reforming research assessment, and uh, in the next part, we will discuss uh, what's in it for the universities. We will first present what we think it is uh, in it for the universities in Poland, but uh, it is, of course, uh, your input into the discussion, which is most welcome. Well, okay, let's start uh, from the first, uh, from the some kind of a introduction, taking into the account uh, what has Change, what uh, have changed uh, in the last years in the research assessment area. During the last two decades, we have observed first an advancement and then the domination of um, bibliometric tools in the research assessment. This process has happened parallelly to the explosive growth of the number of publications, which uh, was the result uh, of the philosophy of publish or perish. 
The use of bibliometric indexes uh, and analysis tools appeared to be attractive because of the couple of uh, features. First, they could be automated, so they can cope with the large and constantly increasing numbers of publications and different sources of uh, different forms of the of the uh, scientific output then the second is that uh, are perceived uh, as having neutral character it means they do not depend on who carries out the assessment and finally the final but very important uh, feature is that they provide quantitative results numbers and those numbers can be straightforwardly used for many types of comparisons, rankings, and other applications. The pro proliferation of various bibliometric indexes took place subsequently, and they have, those indexes have been supported by big publishing houses that extended their business to selling data on publications, in addition to selling the publications itself. The appeal of bibliometry was so attractive that in some countries, organizations and disciplines, the looking up bibliographic indices became a synonym for the assessment of the quality of the research. In particular, non-specialists started to believe that they now have a good and simple tool to assess researchers and research institutions even without having any knowledge of what is this research about. This particularly is valid for the broad public and for the politicians. But gradually, some adver adverse side effects uh, started to be seen. Researchers, as could be expected, started to adjust their publication patterns and decision to maximize the indices, not necessarily the quality. A number of disadvantages started to be reported. One of them is attempt to maximize publication output by splitting the research into as many papers as possible, result resulting in a wave of publications with little or no practical value. Of course, this adverse effect did not happen everywhere, but they have been noticed in many, many situations. The second effect I would like to mention here is a proliferation of journals and publishing houses, including predatory publishers and predatory conferences, to cater to the increasing demand for maximizing the number of publications and giving a possibility to publish almost everything what would be needed. The maybe not direct effect, but also visible is uh, the avoiding of groundbreaking but risky research. It applies to researchers who think that it is better to uh, go for a research in the established areas, doing some incremental work, and be sure that the results will be published and included in this bibliometric, uh, bibliometric uh, assessment, and not going for uh, something which could be groundbreaking, but has a risk that will not provide the results that are publishable in a given time. But it also applied to the journals, because in some cases there were reports of um, editorial boards that uh, also didn't like the very risky uh, research um, papers, because they were concerned that if it's not that interesting, it will not attract enough citations. And citations are the parameter that de determines the impact factor. And many of, the, uh, many of the editorial boards would like this impact factor to grow. But then it is, again, choosing for the safe way, which is not always good for the progress of science. With this big growth of the, of the uh, number of uh, papers and journals, the, we started to observe the erosion of peer review quality. I'm sure that most of you are many times approached to uh, review some papers and the manuscripts. And uh, for many of uh, researchers, this type of, uh, of request comes with the frequency of few per week. It means 
many of this uh, assessment, of this review, uh, has to be squeezed into the rather short time, what uh, has an impact on the review quality. But there were also some kind of a, a more um, morally, uh, very badly, more, I mean, very bad uh, practices uh, from the moral point of view, like citation farms. It means the groups of uh, of uh, person that published them, that published papers and cited themselves in such a way that they started to appear on the list of highly cited uh, scientists, etc. And those lists were uh, sometimes uh, seen as a important tool for finding the stars of the of the science and finally uh, the what uh, has been also observed and it was quite uh, quite uh, broadly discussed uh, a couple of years ago uh, the credibility of scientific results got worse and uh, it was because of the uh, because of the uh, idea that uh, to publish the results, it's sometimes sometimes better to leave out the negative uh, outcomes of some experiments or to uh, provide just a part of the material uh, to make it uh, appear better or more convincing as it is. And that was the, in, cer in certain moments, uh, there were, uh, there were especially in the, in the pharmacy industry, there were some comments that uh, there are just very few papers in the area of pharmacy that which, which results could be reproduced and the others are not reproducible because only the part of the information has been shared. Well, uh, that was about, about the publishing, but uh, focus on the research uh, assessment that is exclusively based on bibliometrics discouraged uh, academics from getting involved in other activities, like, for example, promoting the science and academic values, mentoring young researchers, societal involvement, innovative activities in society, contributing to democratic process, leadership roles, involvement in university governance, or just development of their home institutions. I think that most of the uh, senior managers in the university world uh, recognize this problem of uh, convincing uh, academics to do something more than just doing the research and publishing as much as possible. While without this involvement, the development of universities and institutes uh, it's not going to happen. It will be always a kind of uh, uh, the focusing on one activity and leaving out the other activities with the explanation that it does not count in the final assessment of someone's performance. Well, uh, as these uh, effects have been uh, noticed uh, quite broadly, there was a movement for a more holistic and balanced uh, approach in which bibliometry in which bibliometry uh, has been used but just as one of the tools of the assessment probably the best known document uh, in this uh, area is a san francisco declaration research assessment or dora you can see it here on the screen in the upper left corner and it stems from 2012 has been published in 2012 and uh, it might be uh, a surprise to some of you it has been published during the meeting of american society for cell biology so the type of the this uh, the area and the discipline which very heavily uses bibliometric traditionally for for assessing the quality of the research but it is also the area in which the adverse effects of purely bibliometric assessment uh, have been seen um, seen rather early. In Poland, this uh, declaration has been signed by a couple of institutions, among them the National Science Center, NCM, 
Foundation for Polish Science and also in International Institute for Molecular and Cell Biology. The DORA, uh, this, this declaration, points out that there are many important outputs from research, publications, but also software, data, reagents, intellectual property, but probably the most important is highly trained young scientists. And not all of them, not all of these outputs can be measured purely by qualitative indicators. Soon another manifestos followed. For example, Leiden Manifesto for Research Metrics. You can see uh, the, the titles of this uh, on, the, on the screen. Uh, Hong Kong principles for assessing researchers that focused on the integrity. There was a discussion of the effect of publication pressure in Amsterdam, which, and the paper showed that mild pressure incentivizes high quality research, but too high pressure has a detrimental effect. A good explanation for what is the problem with, with uh, assessing the research is that uh, we often land in the situation of street lamp effect. We focus on just one thing, for example, citation. Why? Because uh, we just look for this and we don't see the other indicators that could be used and other, other, uh, other areas. And those areas could be for example, collaboration, educational training, uh, career preparation, networking, multi-dimensional multi mentoring, many of them. So what we actually need, we need a more inclusive metrics for success and for achievement in the research. And there are not always have to be the quantitative uh, indices because as already said, not everything can be uh, assessed uh, in, this, uh, in this quantitative way. Well, these developments caused a discussion about making a change. EUA, European University Association, together with DORA, and which was already mentioned, and Spark Europe, so Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition Europe, collected a library of case studies and published uh, a report reimagining academic career assessment, stories of innovation and change. You can see it here, and it has been published in January 2021. Soon after this, uh, the Dutch uh, Rector's Conference published a project, Room for Everyone's Talent, saying that the university is a place for people with different talents. And it's up to the university to provide the environment in which the ta different talents and uh, possibilities of different people could be combined to give the added value of this, of this uh, result. Uh, there was also the, the publication of a responsible research network in Finland that uh, developed the national recommendations while Universities Norway prepared a so-called NORCAM, so Norwegian Career Assessment Matrix, a kind of a toolbox, how to include different aspects of scientific activities and activities related to the research into the way of assessing the research quality and assessing the uh, possibilities for further career, etc. Well, as you can see, these uh, processes took place in different countries, and uh, as a result, the European Commission uh, started consultation on how to facilitate and speed up the changes. This consultation resulted in a so-called scoping result, a scoping uh, report, and this re report uh, actually led to the to the preparation of the agreement on reforming research assessment. Many of the things I have uh, said uh, so far have been uh, included in this uh, as observation in this scoping report. The scoping report was the starting point for making the agreement on research assessment. 
Let me stop uh, here for a moment to look at the Polish context uh, in this uh, story. As in any other country, uh, and most of the other countries, research assessment is done for institutions, and it is the, for example, institution evaluation or the performance funding, and not only for whole institutions, but also for units inside the institution. This is the one way of, and one area of assessing. Then there is another area for assessing the, uh, the uh, research. Uh, it is for project, especially funding agencies do that. On the stage of awarding the grant, considering the grant applications, they see what is the quality of the institution, what is the quality of the research team, but also at the end of the grant, when they have to accept or dismiss the grant results. So for them, it is also interesting how to make this assessment well. And finally, for individuals, when, 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 the, when we speak about the hiring personnel, when we speak about the promotion, when we speak about the internal funding, and we speak about formation or change to uh, research teams. So those three groups, institutions, grant agencies, and individuals are the stakeholders of research assessment system and discussing it has to involve all three of these, uh, of these uh, groups. Well, this summer, a long-awaited institutional evaluation in Poland was uh, finished and its outcome in form of categories for disciplines in institutions was published. The procedure which has been used this time was new, although, although based uh, to some extent on earlier schemes. For most fundamental disciplines, it was still the bibliometric component to the overall score called Criterion 1 or K1 that was most important, with the weight of between 50 and 70%. 50% was for technology and agriculture, 60% natural sciences, 70% for uh, social science and, and humanities. I'm leaving out as a quite a special case the uh, evaluation of uh, art schools and, uh, and this uh, group of institutions uh, because they are very specific and uh, perhaps they deserve to having a separate way of, uh, of assessing their output. The approach to calculation of indices preferred small number of quality publications. This was the difference uh, with uh, respect to the previous schemes, because it was not taking the, uh, the evaluation did not take took into the account all the publications, but just a selected number of publications per institution. But essentially, it was quite a typical quantitative bibliometric parameter. Certainly a quite complex calculation algorithm, just to mention here the effect of co-authorship and, and all these uh, very uh, specific um, elements, made it difficult to navigate. Well, the second criterion, or K2, related the aggregated institutional incomes from research, like grants, contracts, and was also a quantitative parameter. But the third criterion, K3, was a novelty. It was a qualitative one. It was to some extent, uh, because of its definition, it was, it was defined as the impact of research on society and economy. It encompasses all types of activities, and it is based on case studies and evaluated by experts in the qualitative way. The weight was about 20% in the final result. For technology, it was 15%. The importance of this particular criterion is in the fact that this is the only place where the impact and non-quantitative effects are included. I would like to mention here that there is an ongoing discussion on the question of objectivity, of subjectivity of the expert evaluation. But it has to be said that this opens up the 
another area for the uh, for discussing the research uh, research assessment namely it is not possible to just take any expert and get the get the uh, opi expert opinion on the research those experts have to be trained because they also have to understand what is the uh, what is the the, the, the spirit of this uh, evaluation otherwise we can easily end up in the situation that uh, also the experts are uh, are expected to provide the qualitative advice and qualitative opinion they will look up for the bibliometric indices and write just what is uh, what could be found in the bibliometry well if we look at the uh, behavior of the institution institutions in this evaluation process it is clear and i think uh, you have seen it uh, very often unless you haven't seen it and i would like to know this uh, the main effort and the main of main points of interest for the uh, for the institutions and for the management of the institutions was still the maximization of the bibliometric criterion k1 that was the main point on which the the institutions focused I believe that this, re this uh, deserves a closer analysis and reflection. Why is it so? Because I think that uh, the criterion K3 was a perfect place to uh, showcase the, all the achievements that are not directly related to the, uh, to the um, publication and scientific output, but which are as important as, uh, as uh, other. Well, let's switch now from the uh, discussing how the research assessment is done for institutions to how it, is, it works for individuals. Uh, from the experience, we can say that uh, individuals strongly focus, uh, private persons strongly focus on those achievements that advance their careers. In Polish legal system, the uh, research assessment for re individual researchers is almost entirely left to the employing institution. So there is a full flexibility in this, how the criteria, internal criteria for the assessment of the researchers are done. There is a worrying uh, phenomenon that in a number of institutions, it was a clear preference to simply repeat the institutional evaluation rules and criteria to evaluate individual uh, individual and assess individual uh, academics this uh, has a side effect of imposing unnecessary uniformity on career paths and goals because everyone has to optimize exactly the same parameters and uh, and also tries to be active in the same set of, uh, of, um, of, in, of fields. And this process of uh, transferring directly the institutional evaluation scheme to individual evaluation, uh, individual assessment, uh, it's actual, it actually neglects the option to have, uh, to have a diversity of talents that can work inside the institution in a synergic manner, giving the added value. It also hampers searching for added value of cooperation between the academics inside the institution, but also between the institutions themselves. Because if the result of an institution is a simple, straightforward sum of individual contribution, it means that it doesn't matter whether someone cooperates or not, result will be the same. So this additive schemes uh, significantly undermine the chances to have to for institution to have a kind of a signature or a specific set that of the features that make them standing out on the backdrop of all other institutions in the country it also favors pursuing strong individual careers instead of building strong and impactful institutions Someone has uh, put it uh, in the quite extreme form, saying that we can observe that sometimes universities are seen as a hotels for grants and theaters for individual careers. Well, 
maybe a small comment on the how this uh, relates to the public funding and uh, investment in the research. We know that uh, funding for research in Poland is definitely insufficient, but it is still difficult to convince politicians, the broader public, to increase the funding. And uh, this is because bibliometric results are not convincing to taxpayers who would like to see the impact, not the results of the number of papers of citations. On the private funding uh, note, so funding from uh, non-public sources, the research carried out with the aim of, the, of achieving the highest publication results is not valued by the business sector. And the career path that is focused on the, having the, as many publications as possible reduce the chance for a transition between academia and other sectors and consequently reduces the economic impact that universities could have through their alumni and, uh, and young researchers. And finally, research is now a global business. So if we discuss the ways of uh, assessing the research, it is not possible to change the way of assessing it in just one country, not even in Europe alone. We have to reach out to other continents, and it is essential for the success of, uh, of any change to the research assessment. And to have a tool for this, uh, to, to, uh, to, of this uh, reaching out, an impactful forum is needed to bring the positive results of this. Well, this work and uh, the outcome of the discussions after the scoping uh, results uh, have resulted in the agreement on reforming the research assessment. Stefan will say much more about this. I would just uh, like to say that uh, the agreement, final version of agreement after many months of uh, intensive works uh, have been released on uh, July 20th. And uh, since then, the discussion have uh, went into the area on the how to govern and operate the coalition of organizations willing to enact the reform. The drafting team, the group of people who prepared this, uh, this agreement, has taken the role of the interim secretariat that, uh, keeps, the, that keeps the uh, work going on between the publishing of the uh, agreement and the uh, actual formation of the coalition that would like to implement these changes. And uh, it is, uh, I will not go into the detail uh, about this and because uh, Stefan will say more about, but uh, this publication, this agreement, uh, is based on 10 principles. Four of them are overarching. I will just quote very quickly what is in it. Uh, principle one, comply with ethics and integrity rules and practices and ensure that ethics and integrity are the highest priority, never compromised by any counter incentives. Those counter incentives might be the criteria for research assessment, so we have to be aware of it. Second, Safeguard freedom of scientific research. Third, respect the autonomy of research organizations. Fourth, ensure independence and transparency of the data, infrastructure and criteria necessary for research assessment and for determining the research impacts. This is the framework in which the, every attempt to reform the research assessment has to fit into. As for the assessment criteria and processes, the principles are focus research assessment criteria on quality, not on quantity, but on quality. The second is recognize the contributions that advance knowledge and the potential impact of research results. And finally, there are four principles that relate to that are related to diversity, inclusiveness, and collaboration. Recognize the diversity of research activities and practices with a diversity of outputs and reward early sharing of open collaboration. Then, 
use assessment criteria and processes that respect the variety of scientific disciplines, research types, as well as research career stage, and acknowledge multi, inter, and transdisciplinary, as well as intersectorial approaches when applicable. Then acknowledge and valorize the diversity in research roles and careers, including roles outside academia. And finally, ensure gender equality, equal opportunities, and inclusiveness. These are the principles. How to work out those principles into the actual scheme, as you can see, will depend on the disciplines, on the countries, on the type of institutions, but the agreement leaves enough space and flexibility for de developing different tools and solutions inside this, this framework. Why I'm telling this? Because uh, in the next steps, uh, we would like, and I think all we who are on the stage would like to, uh, to um, ask you to consider signing this agreement, but not just as because it's advertised as something worth signing, but after uh, analyzing it and having being a uh, very well informed about how it works, what could be done, and all the all the details. It's not the intention to have um, just um, institutions that will sign and will forget about this. The point is that we would like to invite all the institutions to work together to in order to make a progress in the uh, in the assessment of uh, research and to make it better than it is now, following the developments of the, of the outer world. Thank you very much for your attention in this part and I'm inviting uh, Stefan to. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation and uh, uh, Dr. Bergman's uh, gives us information about the agreement of, of on reforming research assessments. So please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zaninka, for uh, for hosting us today. Uh, thank you, of course, to CRAS uh, for uh, agreeing to do this uh, national workshop with the uh, European University Association. And thank you, uh, Martin, for the for a great introduction. I think you you set up the context really well there. Uh, I'm going to be getting a bit technical. I'm going to get into the agreement itself so that uh, you get a sense of what's in there. Even though I'm going to be explaining it to you, I would urge you all to read it. All the answers are in it. Just yesterday on the flight to Warsaw, I had decided to read it again. It had been, oh, back in June, I think the last time I read it, uh, but it was still part of the drafting. Now I read it uh, after a few months with new eyes, and I was going, wow, this is amazing. Most of the answers that people ask me are actually in the document, even more than I thought. So I would urge you, uh, of course, to read it. How did we create it? Well, the whole process was a co-creation exercise. First, the European Commission decided to be the facilitator. They were the ones who started the process by producing the report with the principles that uh, that Marcin just uh, that just presented to you, okay, they then came to us back in December last year. I was I remember remember I was at IKEA. I was buying stuff for my new apartment, and uh, Kostas Glinos from the European Commission calls me. So I pick up the phone at IKEA, and he says, "Stefan, we need to talk about this because we'd like to have uh, universities." in the drafting process and we would like EUA to represent those the, the universities. I didn't say yes right away, we had further conversations, but in January we started the work with the drafting team. So the drafting team you see there at the top is made up of Science Europe, representing the funders, EUA, representing the universities, Karen Strohband, who is a researcher who has expertise in research, on research, but also is a young researcher, and that, that was also important. She was actually holding the pen. 
She was a person writing the, uh, the uh, drafting the agreement. And then, of course, we had the European Commission as the facilitator in this group. So that, that's the drafting team. But we did not do that on our own. As you can see on the side, we've got a core group uh, that was like a, a sounding board. The core group was made up of 20 uh, uh, organizations, including university associations like CESAR, for example, like LERU, like the Guild, like Irun, that were in there. But we also had many other representatives that were actually a broad representation of the research community. And we had, uh, I think it was up to six meetings we had with them in the drafting process to make sure that actually we were in the right direction. And we were asking them for feedback. They were not the only ones we asked feedback to. There was also what we call the stakeholder assembly. Stakeholder assembly was made up of, it is made up today, of more than 350 organizations who signed on because they were interested in the process. So for them and with them, we organized four, four meetings. Last one took place just two weeks ago. But in the drafting process, we had three meetings that took place. And each time we presented where we were at with the agreement and collected their feedback also to put it in there. Trust me, it was a huge amount of work. Uh, at the last, in the second meeting, for example, we had more than 500 comments that we received from the stakeholder assembly uh, on, on, the, uh, on the agreement. Those who were also involved that you see there um, on the left are actually the member states. So the governments uh, of the member states were indirectly involved through the Arab Forum um, because they were kept informed on the process and the drafting and they were able to provide feedback also in the process. It was clear that they could not be part of the research community because they are not, but we made sure that they were also able to be involved. And that's important because we wanted the final agreement that resulted from this to be also something that they would be on, on board, uh, of course. And we have been successful with that. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, this is a process politically that led actually to the agreement and to the coalition. What you can see there is that it started back uh, in May 2021, and we're talking about the new era. So with the new commission coming in, uh, a whole process started uh, revitalizing a concept that had existed before, which is European research area. Uh, with that, there were several um, you know, uh, steps that took place between member states and commission, but also in which uh, stakeholders like universities got involved. Uh, in February of 2022, this year, uh, the French under the French presidency, there was a par Paris call on the research assessment that took place as part of the Open Science Conference. And of course, within the era forum for transition, as I was mentioning, we were able to discuss the development of the agreement with the member state, and it culminated before the publication of the agreement in July, with the council conclusions in June 2022 on open science under the French presidency. And why do I mention this? Well, because it's a unique opportunity that we have today. It's really conjunction. It is the research community and a bottom-up approach, approach coming up with a proposal of an agreement and of a coalition but we're not alone in this because the member states are supporting this reform. To be able to have council conclusions, all member states need to agree on the text. And in, in my life as a person in Brussels working on policy, I have never ever seen before a text in council conclusion that are so aligned and so much in agreement with what we want to do. So we are in this unique opportunity time where actually what we want as a research community is actually paralleled by also what member states are ready to do. So I think that's quite unique. So back to the agreement, huh? what's in there? Short introductions, then it goes into the principles. And Martin just mentioned you know, those principles. I think they're very important. Uh, they are not itself, itself the core, because the core are the commitments, but the principles are indeed the framework in which we were developing those commitments. Uh, 
Then you have commitments. I'll go over those. There's, and you get all the slides afterwards, just so you know, because I see someone taking a picture. I'll be sharing all those slides. Huh? So you have four core commitments supported by six supporting commitments. Then principle on the organization and the operation of the coalition itself. I'll go into details. There's a time frame, obviously, because we cannot have something that's open forever. We want to act. I think this is a big difference between disagreement and, for example, declarations like the DORA declaration. They are declarations that you sign and then you don't have to do anything about it. Here we're talking about getting down to business. We're talking about getting our hands dirty and doing the reform altogether. So that's the time frame. Of course, there's room at the end to sign and to put a date in there, and there's a few annexes. So let's go into the details. First, in terms of the vision, huh? first, all the signatories of disagreement do agree that there's a need actually to have a reform of research assessment. So that's the first important aspect. And the vision here is to have assessment of research, but also of researchers of research organizations. And the whole goal, the whole vision, is to do this to keep in mind and to bring in the diversity. So we're talking about diversity of outputs, diversity of practices and activities. This is exactly what Martin was, was mentioning. Let's not just focus on what we publish. Let's look at all the rest that we do and I shouldn't say we, to be honest, because I'm not a researcher anymore, but th that researchers do. And that's what I think is a vision. Scope, well, we're talking about research performing organizations, including, of course, universities. Uh, the research units also, but the research projects and individual researchers. So this is what the, 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 the agreement covers, including also teams in here. Uh, the whole point is to have a frame. The agreement is to have an agreement on a common direction. Where is it that strategically we want to go with this reform? And very importantly for us universities is that institutional autonomy is at the heart of the agreement. This cannot be achieved if it's imposed on us. It is for us to decide how we want to implement this reform. I'll come back to this also later. How are we going to do it? Because one thing, as I said, is to sign an agreement. Another one is to implement it. And so the implementation is going to go through a coalition, a group of our you know, funding organizations, performing organizations, but also assessment authorities, agencies, etc. The associations that they represent, EUA, for example, I hope will be part of the coalition. We will know on Friday if the council decides that. And beyond that, of course, learn society and all potential relevant organizations. I have to insist, not for-profit organizations. We don't want them to be part of this for now. Uh, we might get into a dialogue with them later, but they have no, no room to play with, the, uh, with the, the, uh, the agreement and the reform for now. Beyond Europe, we also want to go global. There's no point making this a European exercise, a European uh, adventure. We know very well. I did my postdoc in the US. You can tell from, from my accent. Research is global. Researchers are mobile. So, of course, it's great if we can do it in Europe. With our hope is to make this a global, uh, a global reform, of course. So, what we will do is work really on systemic reforms. But we will do this on a common basis. So we will have common uh, principles and a common time frame also. I'll come back to that. The whole point of the coalition will be to have a safe space where we're all able to gather and discuss, exchange ideas. It's really a mutual learning exercise that is foreseen to be able to implement. You will do the work in your institution, but you'll be able to discuss that reform that you're implementing in your institution with many others, other universities, but also others in the sense of funders, for example, evaluation authorities, for example, and even, even though they will not be part of the coalition, with governments in this case. So let's go now to the, 
the commitments. And I'll start with the four core commitments. And again, any presentation I do, any text you read here, will never give you the depth that you will get if you read the agreement. So please, I urge you, go and read that. The first commitment is about recognizing the diversity of contribution that Marcin has just mentioned. So this is diversity in terms of uh, the careers, of course, but also uh, research, in this case, in accordance with the needs and the nature uh, of the research. So that's the first one. It's all about recognizing this diversity that we were talking about. The second core commitment is, and I, I forgot to mention that, there are two commitments, the two first ones, that are, I think are the overarching commitment that are more setting the direction. What is it that we want to do and how do we want to do the reform? The, sec the, the three and four are more about what we don't want to have anymore. Okay? So the second one is the fact that you need to base research assessment mainly, as was mentioned also before, on a qualitative approach, on a qualitative evaluation, where peer review is going to be central, obviously, uh, in this case. Uh, yes, there will be indicators, quantitative ind indicators, but they should only come in support of this qualitative approach. So that's for the first two. Now let's move on to the, th the, the two other ones that are more about what we don't want. Well, the idea is to abandon, and the next word is key here, ban inappropriate users. And we define in the agreement what we mean by inappropriate user. So it's not about abandoning, in this case, journal and publication-based metrics, and in particular, of course, the journal impact factor or the H index. No, it's not about abandoning them. It's about abandoning their inappropriate use. An example, simple. My H, H index is, I think, still 15, 16. Should I be evaluating myself based on that? No, of course not. It has nothing to do with that. A journal impact factor was invented to evaluate a journal, not a person. That's the whole point. When Garfield invented it, it was to help librarian evaluate journals. So no point using the GIF to evaluate a researcher, a research project, a university, a team, for example. So that's the whole point. And then the same can be said about university rankings. It should be we should avoid the use of rankings uh, uh, of universities in research assessment. Again, ranking in university and then using that to evaluate a researcher doesn't make any sense. So again, it's about the inappropriate use of those rankings. So those are the four core commitments. We didn't have six supporting uh, commitments. And here what it is is, well, how, what, what are the things we need to be able to implement those four commitments and move towards a reform of research assessment? Well, obviously, we're going to need resources. So that's number five. You need to be able to commit resources to reforming research assessment according to your needs. You will be the ones, and I insist on this again, they, you will have the autonomy to define your own work plan when it comes to the reform to implement those commitments. But you will need to be able to allocate resources, that staff and budget also. Obviously, most universities today in Europe are already working on changing the way they assess. And of course, what you do already there is something you can allocate here. No point saying you need more, potentially you'll need, you'll need more, but of course you're doing that already. So that's about committing resource. Number six is a bit longer because it is about reviewing and developing research assessment criteria, tools and processes. So this is, this is what I meant by getting your hands dirty. This is where your universities are, not, are going to need to think about first reviewing, how is it that we're doing it today? Which are the criterions that we use? Which tools do we use? How do we proceed in doing that? And I think the, uh, I, I, I love those national workshops because I learn, and today I learned from Martin, you know, how it's going on in Poland and how you're influenced, of course, by the government procedure that, that, was, uh, just, that he just explained. But here it's really about reviewing that. And so you need to be able to do that for your, inst 
you know, the criteria for your institutions and for your units. And then, of course, also for the researchers and the projects. And each time, and it's clearly made, uh, it's made clear in the uh, commitment, you need to do that by involving also the researchers in the process. It cannot be just a top-down exercise. So that's very important also. Again, I cannot give you all the details. Please go and read the agreement. You'll have more, more of the information there. So supporting commitment, also raise awareness. And, and, and Marcin mentioned that before. You're going to need to train people so that they can do uh, the research assessment. So it's about training. It's about providing guidelines. It's about communicating about this, raising awareness. Number eight is about exchanging the practices and experience. So this is part of the coalition. This is a mutual learning exercise that will take place within the coalition, but also beyond. That's how you're going to learn how others are doing. You're going to learn the challenges that others, for example, uh, in Norway and Netherlands, they're probably ha ahead. Well, we have a lot to learn from them, actually. Number nine is about communicating your progress. This is a non-binding agreement. There's no legal imposition or assessment of how you're doing. Yet, morally, you're going to be asked by others in the coalition or in your university, well, what are we doing about this? That's why you're going to need to communicate your progress, actually, uh, towards uh, the, uh, the commitments and within the principles. And finally, there is also something about research on research. It's evaluating the, praxi the practices, the criteria, the tools based on solid evidence. So we can only make progress if we collect the right data to assess where it is that we are today and how we're progressing in the development of this reform. So those are the commitments, and I'm sure we'll get more questions. I told you about a time frame. This is a time frame. So we're talking about five years. If you are to sign today, but I insist, signing will be open almost forever. We understand that not everybody is ready to sign now today. But if you were to sign today in 2022, you would, in the first year, after one year, we would expect actually you, your, your university, to provide with your work plan. After one year, you will have to show that you started the process. So if you're thinking about how, you know, the reviewing, how are we going to review, how are we going to be developing the criteria, the tools, the processes that we want to implement for our universities. And then after five years, we will expect you to have gone through at least one cycle of reviewing and development. Based on your work plan that you will establish, and I insist that you yourself will establish specifically for your university, that will be actually uh, what, what is expected uh, of you. Uh, and of course, as I said, the timing will be based on whenever you sign up. The, the five years start then. In addition, in an agreement, but not actually part of agreement, when you sign, you don't sign these annexes, there are different annexes. Annex one is about uh, the needs. Why is it that we need a reform? So to explain, I find it very useful, and I read it again yesterday, I find it very useful because actually it gives me a, the argument on why it is that we need this. And I use this, of course, when I, when I speak with people. Annex 2 is about terminology. It's a glossary. It's just being clear about what we mean. And when I said, for example, uh, inappropriate use, of course, those terms are, every, are very important. And as you can imagine, having gone through such a, an extensive and co-creative uh, drafting process, every single word in the, the agreement has been thought about very carefully. Annex 3 is a proposal proposal of a reform journey, but it's not imposing it on anyone. It's just an example of how you could go about doing this reform. And then X4 is a first toolbox. We expect this toolbox to get richer and bigger as we progress, because there's going to be a, a more experience learned as part of the coalition. Uh, the agreement was published on the 20th of July, and signatures signing was opened up on the 28th of September. During the RNI days, 
whereas if you see uh, Commissioner Gabriel was present, there was Paul Boyle, Vice President of EUA, uh, Lydia Boyle Damien, Secretary General of, um, of Science Europe, as well as uh, Sylvie Rotaillot, the French Minister for Research uh, and, Innov uh, and Innovation. So that's when we launched actually the uh, signatory. 51 organizations, the logos are right, right behind there, uh, had already signed at that stage, had approached us to sign that. That's also when we launched the website on the coalition, the, the COARA website. So this is the place where you can go actually and sign. Where are we at today? So in less than a month, we've actually almost tripled the number of signatories. We were, and this is uh, on Monday, we are at 135 signatories at this point. The good news for universities is that we are the majority. As you can see, we're talking about 40% uh, of the signatories are universities. Between you and I, that's not enough, huh? I think we, we need to have many more universities in there. Uh, second group, as you can see, are Academies Learning Society, uh, sorry, Research Center, Research Infrastructure. So great, because when you see the biggest group made up of 60% is actually RPOs, Research Performing Organizations. So we're well, we're well represented in there. Then comes the academies, uh, et cetera, and you can see the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the numbers there. So that's the split right now, and the number as of today, it's, it's growing. Huh? And if you go to the website, by the way, you can see all the signatories. Please keep in mind that we've got a, a lag, a, a time by which when we receive a signature, we have to go and check, of course, if, it is, if we have the logo, if we have the signature, if it is indeed the right organization, etc. So there's always a delay from the time you sign and from the time you appear on the website. How does it look like in terms of uh, the, number, the numbers for countries? Well, there you go. Uh, biggest number is Europe, meaning European associations like, for example, the EUA. We will fall in there if we sign after uh, Friday. But not, not unexpectedly, Netherlands is there on the top, followed by France. I think that the whole impact of the Open Science Conference and Paris call was quite big in France. That said, with the number of universities they have, I would hope that it would go up. So you see that Poland is right there. Right now we've got five signatories from Poland. But I hear that uh, that's also going to go up. I worry about those that who are not yet in there. And that's some of the focus we will have in getting those numbers to grow. As I said, when it comes to the university sector, we're talking about 44, uh, 54 in total. That includes 47 universities, uh, four national rectors conferences in this case, and three other, three other university networks uh, who have already signed, for example, the Arun, uh, has signed already, if I remember correctly, and you can see again the split. I know for a fact, from having spoken to many national rectors conferences and universities, that more are coming. It's just that for universities, it takes time to get this through their board and to get the, uh, the, uh, the full approval. So I know that more of them are coming, and I see that the growth we're seeing right now is quite positive. Huh? We're, you can see that we went from 35% at the very start to about 40% right now, and that's stable. And you can see a steady increase that we're witnessing actually uh, with the number of universities that are coming. Still, I think we need to have more. We need, and we'll talk about that later, to ensure that the university sector is well represented within the coalition, also within its steering board, because we wanna ensure that the interest of universities is taken into account in the reform and through the coalition. So, as was you know, said by Martin before, I think that we, I will urge you to sign and we will answer your questions because I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Be aware of a cutoff date. You will, as I said, be able to sign in the future anytime. But if you wanna be part of the constitutive assembly, the first general assembly of COARA, the coalition, you will need to sign by 17th of November because we need two weeks to be able to process all of that and to be able then to host you on the 1st of December for the first uh, assembly. And I'll come back to uh, what will happen at that first assembly. But if you want to sign, 
please just go to the Coara website and you will find very easily the place where, where you can sign on uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, the, to, be, to be part of the coalition. There you go. I think that I'm done for my part for now. And I'm really keen to uh, answering any of your questions. And I haven't looked much at you online, but of course, more than happy to answer your question. So please add your questions to the chat and the three of us will, uh, will do our best to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Marcin Powis and Dr. Stefan Bergmans for your, I think, very interesting presentations. And uh, from my point of view, it's a, uh, great to be speaking here on the wider strategic aim of reforming academic careers, which is new for us, and research assessment. And I know that we know after uh, Dr. Bergman's presentations that it is a priority for the European University Association to create a coalition of organizations committed to implementation, implementing reforms of the current research assessment system. And in Poland, we are just in the beginning, or we should be in the middle, but we are the beginning of uh, discussion about research assessment system. So uh, we will go ahead and take some time for questions. Firstly, I invite the audience present with us uh, online uh, uh, to just remember about the question boxes and we ask our uh, presenters, our key speakers to uh, ask, to, to answer uh, these questions. Uh, uh, and I invite the audience, which is in present to ask the questions. I can see first one. So please, we start with the audience. Uh, Professor Lucina Wojniak from the uh, Vice Rector for Research, uh, Medical University of Łódź. Uh, thank you very much for these presentations. I think they were very important for us and they're very much required because we've just finished the national evaluation and um, we have uh, a lot of comments and obviously uh, we evaluated the evaluation as well. However, I would like to comment first on Professor Powell's uh, presentation and then we'll ask uh, if you don't mind a couple of questions to you. The first uh, comment and question to Professor Powell's was um, about uh, the dichotomy which we face these days, having national list of papers um, and uh, journals and um, uh, the generally used indexes uh, um, and the evaluation of international evaluation on, uh, on journals, as you said, and not uh, uh, papers. However, this dichotomy is created in this country and is increasing problem because it not also creates a completely parallel uh, 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 academic life and academic evaluation in completely parallel ways by the list of ministry and by the internationally recognized, recognized uh, criteria, which especially is important in, and then I will come to the levels on individual uh, researcher evaluation level, because uh, I don't know how it is in other universities, but we obviously take international indexes, not uh, the, in the list of ministry, when we evaluate individuals, PhD students, uh, uh, people who apply for uh, promotion at the university of whom we want to promote. So this is parallel life, which is uh, the, the gap between these two lists is increasing, and we know it very well. And we have to manage as uh, authorities of the university uh, and answer very uh, uh, unfortunate questions from, the, our, from our researchers. So this dichotomy exists, and it cannot be transferred on the coalition, of course. We have to arrange it at the Polish, at the Polish uh, level and i think it is probably the beginning of completely different discussion 
because if we want to be members of uh, this fantastic idea and fantastic uh, uh, concept, we have to have one clear message to our universities, to our employees, to our students, PhD students and researchers. What we are asking them to do and how we are asking them to proceed and how can we evolve and how finally we will evaluate them so this is on this on this dichotomy which within within sol solution i could be very skeptical about uh, participation of polish universities because we will do another evaluation we will put a lot of effort to do this evaluation and then we will have to do another national evaluation based on the ministry list so this is that this doubles doubles our activity in this in this field and doubles our work we have to do so this is on this uh, on this um, on this uh, evaluation because uh, one of the core commitments is inappropriate use of these indicators so if we multiply national indicators, uh, international indicators and citation indexes twice, um, it's 12 times we will do the same job, 12 times. And what does it mean in this context, inappropriate? This is, this is a clue question. What does it mean inappropriate? If I evaluate my PhD student, is it appropriate to check what kind of papers they published? If I evaluate professor, is it okay to check what kind of papers did they publish? What is the impact of this? So what is the list, list, list of citations? When I evaluate a department on the, on the level of the university, is it inappropriate when I take all of these factors into consideration? Then we go to the university, etc., etc. In Poland, we don't evaluate universities we eva evaluate disciplines. So talking about interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary factors, influence, is absolutely, let's say, fantastic in this context, because we evaluate disciplines. Disciplines competing within this evaluation, each with other. So this is this is the, the, the question um, the questions which we have to ask ourselves in Poland when we ask our institutions to join. I would like to join very much, but I have to be sure that I will not do this training for nothing, because then I will have to do another national evaluation and there will be completely different approach. So this is the first question. And now the question to to our guests uh, who fantastically presented the, the concept and the idea. And you several times uh, uh, um, talked about Norway and the evaluation in Norway, but you did not uh, say uh, nothing about Czech Republic. I, was, uh, I had a pleasure and honor to be a member of two panels of national evaluation of uh, universities in Czech Republic starting three years ago, and now uh, we are um, evaluating the Masaryk University faculty by faculty. And this is some which, in my opinion, can be a good practice, because all of the factors you were talking about, which are not only connected with metrics, but with all other levels of activity of individuals, departments, uh, and other structures within the university are there very well prepared. So why don't we start from discussing good practices when they are, and we start from scratches? I can uh, I can uh, say that I'm uh, very impressed with uh, the evaluation that is done in Czech Republic because it's international one. The boards are quite broad because for the Faculty of Medicine. There were 13 people from all over the world evaluation, evaluating this, this faculty. And the self-evaluation presented by the faculty is very impressive because it has all of these factors, all of these uh, uh, criteria you were talking about. 
So why not to uh, involve them also broader in evaluation of their evaluation and just uh, improve what is not perfect, but uh, have some frame for further discussion. Thank you very much. Well, I think that there was there was a um, number of uh, of uh, issues raised uh, here, but uh, maybe uh, I will try to address at least some of some of them. Maybe not uh, not all. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, um, you first um, commented on the different way of uh, using the bibliometry uh, for bibliometric indexes that are uh, accepted in the world or are re readily available for everyone and the ministerial list of ministerial points or however we call it well um, there is a there is a probably some uh, reasons why these uh, two systems uh, have been introduced uh, and the first reason is that uh, the indexes, uh, these general indexes, do not exist for all disciplines. In some disciplines there are simply no indexes like this and they have to be uh, created somehow. The second is that uh, the, um, it's a, there is a problem which is quite general and uh, it is probably also one of the topics for the discussion, how to get out of this disciplinary framework and uh, but, and uh, assess the interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary activities because uh, the impact fact journal impact factors they work very well if uh, the journal is in the mainstream of some discipline but once there are some publications that are coming from other disciplines because of the interdisciplinary research into the journals in another discipline the way how to assess how to use these indexes is not straightforward anymore but uh, definitely having two very different systems uh, for points is uh, something uh, that uh, causes a lot of work and we should go towards the having something more unified in order to to, to have this but uh, the, the discussion about the research assessment uh, could either go along improving the bibliometric uh, parameters and uh, focusing on how we can make the bibliometry better than so far, or to make another approach saying the bibliometry is not everything. We have to, it will not uh, provide uh, perfect data, but we have to look outside of, the, uh, of, the, of this uh, bibliometric box. And uh, this is maybe a way out of a of, uh, couple of, uh, of problems you have mentioned, because we can go, uh, we, can, we can try to find an uh, alternative way of assessing, not by using the indexes and trying to improve these indexes uh, again and again. And this is uh, exactly the task, in my opinion, for the coalition to discuss how the things are done in different countries because it seems that uh, at least from my experience with uh, participating in discussions on the research assessment in many countries uh, there are similar problems and in many countries there are quite interesting solutions how to overcome some of them so learning from each other is the one of those uh, most important parts of the participation in coalition Coalition is not going to impose some, uh, by, the, by the decision, some uh, um, schemes, but it's rather a place where people can work together in order to see how they can borrow good ideas from each other. And sometimes by discussing, they can come up with better solutions than in every, every of the countries, every uh, country inside. And uh, maybe one thing that uh, I would like to, uh, to, to emphasize, um, it is, in my opinion, not possible to have different schemes of um, a research assessment applied to the same university in the same country. So I would rather see the exercise as a changing of the 
forma of the legal way of assessing the research, which is uh, in the hands of the ministry and not making a parallel processes, because that would, as you rightly said, uh, keep us busy all the time and probably we wouldn't have enough time for research because we would be busy with the assessing the research. So definitely this type of discussion has to be over, uh, has to come to the point in which there are some recommendations to the ministry to change the way how the, or modify the way how the research assessment is done. And uh, mm, yes, the good question is how to do it in practice, but again, uh, the coalition could be a good place to find some answers because there are uh, legal frameworks in some countries which are even more rigid than framework in Poland. And those countries are also thinking how to, how to make their ministers think differently about this. So there is, there is, there is place for this. And of course, the Czech, um, Czech uh, evaluation exercise is one of the very good um, points for the presenting uh, to the broader public uh, how to, how, what are the possibilities and what are the ideas in different countries. But thank you very much for, for very interesting and the point uh, findings about this. So if I thank may... Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I would like to add okay. for these questions. I think that uh, but bi bibliometry is sometimes very useful tool. It's just a tool, especially in some purposes and in some disciplines, I think in medical disciplines. Yes, but for yeah but for me it's important some i can say it's a problem with publication bias because um some results some research research results are not <laughs> it's just negative results are not published sometimes so it's kind of problem maybe challenge with publication bias which we can see very often using uh, bibliometry. So thank you, Stefan. No, no, no problem. It's, 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 Elsevier, please answer the, the, uh, another questions. Elsevier created once the uh, journal for negative results. They had to close it because there was not enough submission. No wonder, huh? It was not one that was going to be a dra uh, driving enough uh, citation, obviously. I think that's the whole state of mind. Bibliometrics should not be anymore the central uh, you know, tenant of research assessment. So yes, I understand your concerns, but that's exactly what we're aiming at doing with the agreement. The example I like to use is that we had a very uh, recently uh, a meeting at EUA of all the negotiators. So we're talking the negotiators group, the ones from universities that go and negotiate in every country uh, with the publishers. And they were the ones telling us that this reform is crucial for them. Because if we are successful with this reform, it will give them a very strong position at the table of negotiations with the publishers. Because publishing is not going to you know, become obsolete, but it will be one of many things that will be taken into account. Whereas today, it is the one thing that is taken into account. So I think that's the whole point here. And I'm not saying we're going to get there tomorrow. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to say we're going to get there in a few years. And that's what our aim should be. So that's just about bibliometrics. And just to be clear, inappropriate use that we're asking about, it's right in there. So there's three points de defining the inappropriate use. So I'm not going to spend the time reading it, but it is in the agreement explaining. And one of them is relying exclusively. You should not do assessment only with with actually the uh, the uh, use of author based metrics so that's one um, one thing i'd like to, to to so martin answered most of the question and he did it very well one thing he did not mention is the fact that your situation in poland and i probably understood that a little bit this morning uh, talking to, uh, to to both of you is that this coalition and the reform is maybe a tool for you to be able indeed to go and discuss with your government about what it is that they need to be doing in the future. And I'm not just saying this in a very idealistic way. As I mentioned, the council conclusions, uh, the council conclusions on the reform 
are very supportive. Poland signed that. And beyond that, within ERA, ERA Action 3 is the reform of research assessment. And Poland committed to that, to that specific action. So even though it might be just words, at least they can be you know, taken, I mean, uh, account, accountable in front of other, other member states, etc. I'll just finish and then and we, can, we can come back to that. And I'm happy to talk about that with you over lunch, and by the way. Uh, on disciplines, I want to make clear one thing. The reform we're aiming to achieve will never be a one-size-fits-all. So it will not be one reform, one system applied to each discipline. Huh? The whole point is to create a frame in which, depending on if you're evaluating a project, a team, a researcher, for example, or different disciplines, you can use different sets, actually, of qualitative approach and potentially metrics. So that's also important to say. And then the last point is, yes, yeah, sorry, I don't know the example in the Czech Republic. What a shame. That's the whole point of the coalition. We need to have them. So I need to check on Maastricht. I think they joined, but Charles is in there, for example. Already. So this is perfect. That's the whole point. As Martin was saying, this is the place where we'll be able to exchange about what's going on, not just in Norway, not just in the Netherlands. In Belgium, I know University of Ghent. They are well in advance compared to many of the other ones in Belgium or elsewhere in Europe. We have a lot to learn from them. But not just that. One thing that to me was really eye-opening talking with universities in the Netherlands is they'll be very open about the challenges they're facing with their reform. And they talk about that. Why? Because they want you to benefit also from those, those lessons they've learned. So this is exactly the point of the, this coalition, is to do this uh, exchange and to learn about what's happening in the Czech Republic, actually. Oh, we've never said it will disappear. Never. It will probably always be one of the indicators. But keep this in mind. Those who are signing on also are funders, including European Commission. So we do and we can expect that, of course, they will change their way of assessing, which is good news, huh? except if they do it alone. If they do it without universities being involved, we're in trouble because they will impose whichever way they think is best. That's why we need universities to be part of this coalition, because it is the only way that we can ensure that as universities, our best interests are preserved in the reform and that we make sure that the way reform is done in the future is the one that is the best applicable for us. Thank you very much. Next question, please. We, I can't see any questions from our audience in person here in the room. So we have questions from our audience online. And please do. Yes, we do. Them. <clears throat> Question number one. What are the main challenges you recognize in implementing the coalition's agreement? Many. I'm not saying that this is going to be easy, and I'm not saying it's going to take uh, place tomorrow. Uh, I think that, uh, and it's, it's quite interesting because uh, I've had uh, recently, uh, uh, you know, I, I was asked to present this in front of Coimbra, and I had the same thing. They came to me asking, what, what are the challenges? What well, I don't know. I don't know yet what the challenges are going to be. The only thing I can tell you is that instead of having challenges yourself all alone as a university or in your national context, come and share that with all the other ones who are trying to do the same thing. Because by being together in this, there's going to be more than, you know, in, in several universities and several brains than, is, than, than in a single one. That's clearly going to be the case. Another challenge that, you know, I, I, one challenge that I can imagine, and we talked about this already, is the fact that there are countries like Poland, like France, like Spain, where the legal framework 
will be inhibiting the reform to move forward. But again, if you just keep on working nationally, you have less chances of this moving forward than if you make this a European and a global uh, reform. Because I think pressure will not come just from inside of your country, but outside of your countries. So no, I don't know all the challenges, but what I expect is the uh, coalition will be the place where those will emerge actually. And we will learn very soon uh, because again, like in the Czech Republic, they will share what the challenges are for them right now in implementing the reform. The Dutch will share also the challenges they are being faced, but not just the challenges. They will tell you also how they're dealing and answering those challenges. What is the work of the European coalition like in the context of similar work in the USA and Asia? So, one of the things we haven't had the time to do yet, because again, as a remind, reminder, we started working on this in January. I think it was uh, in itself an amazing achievement to be able to publish an agreement in July. And we haven't been able to uh, start talking to international partners. That said, we already have, as part of the signatories, international organizations. But it will be one of the aims, strategic aim of the chair, as well as the coach, the vice chairs of the steering board, to actually go out and speak to, uh, to other regions in the world. Uh, we, I know for a fact, for having spoken to uh, Australian researchers, Asian researchers, uh, not American, but uh, North American researchers, that they are aware of this taking place. Just last week, I was talking with someone from the USTP in the US, and they are very well aware. And it's quite interesting how they see this themselves, not as at all a threat, but as an opportunity. For example, the Australian researcher I was talking to had just mentioned that the Austrian government, the new minister, had blocked the new their ref system. He has just blocked it completely. And they see this as an opportunity because uh, they will be able to use the coalition and potentially their uh, them being part of the, the coalition as a tool for them to influence their own governments also. So I think that uh, it is one of the challenges, maybe, as, as you were asking the question about challenges before, uh, but one that um, it's more a, a matter of communication, of raising awareness outside of Europe. And the other ones I hear from uh, our colleagues in Spain who are really keen on getting in on this uh, are the South American. Latin America is looking also at this initiative because they are very much aligned, as you can imagine, uh, with, the, uh, with the objectives uh, of, the, uh, of the coalition. Maybe I can add uh, one more thing is that uh, we, of course, encourage uh, not only European universities to join the coalition and not only the European institutions. And there, are some, there is already some interest for, for joining the coalition from uh, outside of Europe. And definitely we will have to uh, give a good piece of attention to all those who would like to join from outside. They could also bring in a very interesting uh, experiences and knowledge to, to for the working of the coalition. And in that context, I tell too much, I'm sorry. Huh? But let's, let's keep this in mind. This is a unique opportunity also that it is a European initiative. Because I strongly believe that if we are the ones leading this reform, and if it does indeed become a global reform, it will be our own values that drive it and not values from other regions of the world. And yes, I'm thinking about China. I would never want a system to evaluate research that comes from China, for example. But to be honest, same about the US. I don't want a US system imposed also on Europe. So I think this is a unique opportunity for us to seize as Europeans because we could be driving this with our own values as universities and our own values as, as Europeans. Third question. Dear professors, thank you very much for the clear introduction of this so important problem. 
do you think that future expert corps should be national or international for the evaluation of institutions, disciplines in Polish context, on the level of the particular country? I will try to, to answer this question. In general, uh, international bodies are have, have the broader perspective uh, and uh, experience in from, from many backgrounds in uh, uh, evaluating and assessing the research. However, it will, to some extent, depend on the discipline. That are disciplines which are uh, very specific and it might be difficult to find uh, enough, uh, enough um, experts abroad. But there could be an opposite situation that uh, there are some disciplines uh, that there are so few specialists in Poland or the parts of the disciplines or research areas then uh, that uh, having the uh, international expert panel is something absolutely indispensable. Otherwise, we would be uh, really uh, working in the situation of conflict of interest of those who are evaluating and undergo evaluation, which is bad. And uh, in general, the international reaching out to the international experts uh, helps with the problems of conflict of interest and uh, this type of uh, burden that uh, happens uh, sometimes in, in, uh, in some countries. And in Poland, it has been uh, uh, sometimes addressed as a quite important uh, problem that has not yet been overcome uh, sufficiently. Um, and there is a final comment on the chat, which is actually not a question, but I would like to read it aloud to everybody. Dear speakers, just one second. <laughs> just one moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so dear speakers, thank you very much for the clear introduction of this so important problem. Do you think, uh, oh no, that's not the right one, no, no. Sorry, we've had uh, somebody just add a question and the questions just changed the order. Mm, yes, thank you very much for raising this important issue of the research assessment in Europe and in Poland, especially for the focus on the research integrity part. It is really crucial, nothing else matter more and actually focusing on open science practices that should be definitely taken into account. So those are all the comments and questions that have been asked can I, can via... Can I make a quick comment on that one myself? Sure. So yes, perfectly agree. And we've got work ongoing on both. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, indeed at EUA, uh, this work on research assessment stemmed from uh, the work we've done on open science. I can only uh, urge you to go and check the uh, EUA Open Science Agenda 2025, where we have three priorities. One is uh, open access, fair data, and number three is research assessment. So that's for the work we do. That said, as you mentioned uh, also earlier, open science is only one of the elements in there. And more broadly, uh, as a strategic priority for EUA, research assessment is only one step. For us, what is more important in the future is to consider the whole career of, uh, of academics. So it's career assessment, I think, in the future that we will be focusing on, ju not just research assessment. Uh, I would like to add uh, also a um, uh, small comment to, to this from the history of the, uh, of the, of the whole process. Because, uh, as uh, Stefan said, uh, the 
interest for the research assessment uh, was uh, very much uh, started by the work on the open science because uh, and open publishing because it turned out that the uh, few years ago that people are skeptical about the uh, publishing in the open uh, access and uh, the open journals because they said it is not included in the evaluation of their achievements and their research is not served i mean the evaluation of the research is not served by the by the open uh, open journals and that uh, pointed uh, that moved the ua towards the looking closer into this uh, research assessment and that was as stefan reichel said uh, the actual the way how the how the things uh, develop but uh, i would like to uh, point here to the importance of the funders in uh, in the uh, have in developing the framework for research assessment because you probably all uh, remember that uh, open publishing uh, was not something popular in poland until ncn national science center um, embarked on the on the open uh, open publishing and made it uh, required as a, as a condition for the publication in the grants that have been funded by, by this institution. In two or three years time, uh, publication in open journals uh, became a normality in Poland. So it shows how the change of the rules by funders can cause the change of the behavior of uh, researchers as far as their publishing patterns are concerned this is uh, something that we can we, we we could build upon in the future because i would like to uh, also share with you that uh, both the ncn the national science center and the foundation for polish science have already decided that uh, they will join the coalition they had they are in the process of formal formalizing this but uh, they are doing this and similarly the polish academy of sciences has also joined the coalition and signed, signed the uh, signed the uh, agreement and joined the coalition so uh, pardon corporate at this moment corporation the institutes will probably follow anyway if they have a legal entity Yes, of course, and discussion about opus, open science, open access, I think is just on the table and we have discussions about it yesterday and two years, two, two days ago with National Science Center. It, with some problems with funding of open science and problems for young researcher, researchers, so it's it, it needs to, it's not easy topic uh, in Poland, but I think we, we can manage it. So we have uh, time, one minute for one question. But we have no, people are hungry. People are hungry so I would like to, yes, in, uh, invite you for a networking lunch. So thank you for this part of our meeting. Thank you very much. So welcome again. I'm very happy that we can start our second part, second part of our workshop. And we have a first presentation about the coalition governance and next steps. So please, I invite Dr. Stefan Bergmans to tell us about the coalition and next steps, of course. Thank you very much. I have the difficult task of keeping you awake after this excellent lunch. Thank you very much for, for the lunch. Uh, and I'll try to stay awake. So unfortunately, it's going to be about the boring part, I would say, about the coalition, which is uh, the governance, the operation. But it is a, a, a very important one because, of course, once the coalition is established on the 1st of December, we want to make sure that it will start working and it will actually be able to work well together. So that's why we've developed uh, the documents actually on the governance and the operation of the coalition. So what we mean by this is that 
we've been working since the 20th of July, and to be honest, didn't, didn't work too much over the summer. So it started really uh, at the end of August. But we have a governance document that works, uh, that uh, has the guiding principles for the coalition, for the, diff the different structures, the powers that are in place, etc. Uh, we also develop rules of procedures for the working groups. Uh, as mentioned before, but I will go in a, a bit deeper into that. The working groups will really be the key places where the mutual learning exercise will be taking place. So that's the uh, rules of procedure for working groups. Rule procedures for the chairs, vice chairs, and for the steering board, because of course there will be a need for a steering board. Um, then we have we also have a code of conduct and uh, a budget, a draft budget and work plan. And all those documents have been published now on the 20th of October and will be up for vote at the Constitutive Assembly on the 1st of December. So I don't have the time to go over this, I'm sorry. But these are really the principles that are underlying um, the, the conduct, the evolution of the coalition. We want the coalition to be really based on all those different uh, principles. So again, keep, take a close eye. I think most of you will agree with the principles, but it's important that those are, are respected as, as we move forward. Membership. So of course, membership will be op open to all the organizations that will have signed the agreement. It's important. You can only join once you've signed. That's it. You can also decide to sign without uh, joining. It doesn't make a lot of sense because then it's just a declaration. What's really important with the coalition is to get going. Who will be allowed actually to be part of that? Well, you can see the, the, the categories there. We're talking about universities and their association. So you and us, EUA, for example, but CRASP, for example, is also welcome to join. Research center, research infrastructures, and their association. Academies, learned societies, and their associations. But also including association of researchers. We've got several of them already included. Very importantly, young researchers. Eurodoc, Global Young Academy, for example, have already signed the agreement. So it's important to have researchers and young researchers well represented public or private research funding organizations and their association, Science Europe, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, for example, uh, have signed on, ANR in France uh, has signed. And then, of course, finally, the national and regional authorities and agencies, the ones that really implement uh, the, some form of research assessment and their association. It will uh, also be open for not-for-profit organizations that are relevant relevant in the sense that they have they do have a link with research assessment huh? so that's going to be important um, membership will be approved by the steering board in the meantime and until we have a steering board it is us uh, the interim chair so science here of any way that are doing the checking uh, and that's why for example there's a week delay usually between the time you sign and for us to check and approve that uh, important point, even if you join, you will be allowed to join at any time the coalition. And I usually say to people, if you hesitate about joining, don't. Join, be part of the process so that you get all the information, you can see how it works, and in case you're not happy about what happens, imagine the strong message it could send if you resign, if you leave the coalition. So I usually say to people, better in than out. Coalition bodies, General Assembly. This is where all the members will sit. The first one will take place on 1st of December, and it is expected that in the first year, there will be three such assemblies, just because we're, we're going to need to get going. After that, probably one will take place every year. This is the highest level decision-making body of the coalition in the future. Then you've got the working groups. As I said, this is really where the work will take place. So this will be a voluntary participation from the members. So if you're interested, for example, I put it out there, but I'm not saying that's going to be the case. If we create a working group specifically for universities, you're welcome to have one of your staff or yourself join the working group 
and participated in its, in its working. Yeah? So that's going to be really key to get the work uh, done. A steering board that will be elected by the General Assembly. And this is going to be a collegial body of about maximum 11, uh, 11 people that will have the oversight. Uh, the, you know, they will be in charge of the strategy, of the business plan, uh, but also the sustainability. One of the important tasks, as I mentioned, will be to go global, but also to make sure that funding, the money comes in, because we want to sustain this coalition. And then finally, a secretariat. Uh, they will support all the administrative, logistical uh, tasks, etc., cetera, uh, that will be behind. So those are really the bodies that, that are foreseen here. What will the General Assembly do? Well, again, as I said, it's the highest level decision-making body for the coalition. It will actually approve as soon as December, but maybe after if we change it, the governance and the rules of procedure. It will be electing the chair and the vice chairs, but also all the steering board members. It will approve the annual uh, work plan and budget of COARA, uh, but it will also decide who the, the secretary is. And all those decisions will be up on the 1st of December, but might be changed in the future. It will approve the strategy uh, that will be guiding the operations uh, and the activity of, uh, of COARA. Uh, and we will we'll be approving also the strategy for outreach. As I mentioned, we will need to go global, but even in Europe, I think there will be a need to go to places. In the list of countries you saw earlier, there are still some countries that are missing. To me, the worst right now is the one from our commissioner, uh, Murray Gabriel. I don't see any, anyone from Bulgaria who has signed. We need to address those countries too. And then, of course, finally, it will approve the procedures and the criteria uh, that will be running the, uh, the working groups. I think that's also an important element uh, and role of the assembly. The work itself of the coalition will go through the working groups. And we are really seeing them as, if you want, communities of practices. So this is the place where the mutual learning will take place. And it will be offering this space where people can meet and talk, share about their experience, their concerns, and then start thinking about how can we do this in our country or more broadly in Europe and globally. I can imagine there will be interest communities. For example, one that has been raised during the stakeholder assembly is peer review. We know peer review will be a central element for the qualitative approach, yet Many people have questions about peer review. Some others have experience on peer review. And this is a place where we could have discussions, for example, on this. I'm saying peer review just as an example. Huh? It will be a bottom-up approach. It will be members who will suggest the, the, the themes of the working group. Uh, you can imagine disciplines communities. We've talked many times about the differences there, will be, there are between uh, disciplines in the reform and in research assessment. Uh, in general, I think this will be important. But why not also think about working group on interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary? Those also are possibilities. Institution communities, why not think of a working group on universities? That is definitely a possibility. There could be another one on funders, for example, because they all have different problems. Huh? So that's the type of uh, working groups. Of course, there will be national communities. For me, that's almost a given. Uh, the aim of the coalition is also to be able to establish at the national level a dialogue between the governments and the stakeholders in each, uh, in each uh, country. Then, of course, in addition to the working groups, uh, depending on the funding we have and depending on the needs we have, the coalition will be able also to have workshops, webinars that are put in place, of course, conferences. And these will be the places where actually work can continue or work actually of the working groups can be shared, can be further uh, experiment, experimented and discussed. So that's the work of the coalition as foreseen for the future. Timeline, very important. So you know it's been published, that was back in July. As I mentioned earlier, on the 20th of October, a few days ago, we published uh, on the COARA website all the documents on the governance, on the rules of procedures, the code of conduct, the work plan, and the budget. They are all there for you to review and to look at if you want. The reason why it's there is because this is going to be up for votes for the members of the coalition 
on the 1st of December. So that's also important. It, it means that it could still be changed. And there are provisions in, for example, the governance document to be able to change it also in the future based on what the assembly wants. We also published a call for candidacies for the chair, vice chairs, and steering board members. And we do hope that there will be candidates from the university sector so that they can be also elected to the steering board. There can be up to four representatives from the same sector in there. So we do hope that there will be four representatives from, from universities. Deadline for signature, once again, 17 November. You will be able to sign after, but 17 November is the cutoff date to be able to be part of the first assembly on the 1st of December. 17 November is also the deadline for candidacies, chair, vice chair, and steering board member. Because we need a bit of time to be able then to review that and provide then on the 24th of November all the information about the candidates and the interim secretary to the members who then on the 1st of December will take a part in an online uh, assembly meeting that will be chaired uh, by the interim chairs until the new chair and uh, co-chairs and steering board member will be elected. So that's the timeline we have in front of us. I just want to mention that this workshop today is part of a wider endeavor at EUA, where a national workshop is one thing. Yesterday we had uh, the uh, workshop, the third and final workshop in the series we had on the reform of research assessment. All the information presentations, just like today, are available. Uh, we were lucky enough to have, as part of uh, the advisory group within EUA, to provide us advice as we were drafting two members of the board. Number one is here, Martin, and the other one was Patrick, uh, Patrick Levy. And the next key date for us is this Friday. Uh, we are putting to the council, so the 35 National Rectors Conference, the question, should we sign the, the uh, agreement? Should we join COARA? So more on Friday. And then quickly with that, I just want to mention some of the frequent questions we have. What's, you know, what's in it for my institution? I mentioned the five-year timeline. I'm not going to go back over that. That's what really is expected of you. After one year, you have a work plan. You have a vision about what it is that you are going to do it, you're going to do. But importantly, it's based on what you want to do. Institutional autonomy. It will not be imposed on you. After five years, a first cycle will have uh, had to take place. So that's important. Another important element also, there will be no benchmarking between institutions. I want to make that very clear. That's not the aim. And as you can see from a, a copy of the FAQ, the evaluation, if you want, will be self-assessment. It will be yourself assessing against your work plan. And by no means at any time progress of institutions will be validated by the coalition. So that's important to note. Another question we get often, what about resources? Well, I answered that question this morning. You will. It's in, commi in commitment five. There are expectations to be able to do a reform. You will need to be, to be putting some resources. But again, there will not be a minimum that will be required. No? Nothing of that sort will, 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 will be requested. And more importantly, if you are already doing uh, work towards reforming your way of doing assessment, all that can in, be integrated huh, into the, uh, the, the, the coalition. Is this legally binding? The answer is clearly no. It is not legally binding. Yes, you have an agreement. Yeah, yes, there are clear commitments in there. And signing the agreement is a precondition to be able to join the coalition, but the participation will be purely on a voluntary basis. A good example is attending the assemblies and participating in a working group, in two, three working groups, depending on your interests and your capacity. You will remain in full control. You will have the full autonomy. So you will control the pace and the journey of reform you want to get in. And so in a sense, if it's not legally binding, you can imagine it's more morally binding. Because once you sign, everybody knows it within the coalition, so your peers will be looking at you, within your community and your university, your staff can come to you and say, where are we with this reform? 
and then more broadly the whole research community. So again, not legally binding, but probably uh, morally binding. But also importantly, you will be able to leave the coalition at any time if you feel that this is important for you. Funding, no, there will not be any fee to join the coalition. There I want to be very clear. That said, if you want to give some money to the coalition, you're more than welcome, huh? Because this will be on a volunteer basis, both in terms of resources, staff, and resources, budget. Staff, well, yes, again, working groups. You will be joining working groups. That is contributing with in-kind, and that, I think, is an important element. Uh, we will have, uh, we're hoping to get funding from research funding organizations. Some are already indicating, like the European Commission, uh, that they will be providing uh, some funds uh, also in there. Just so you know, the funding models are part of the documents that were published on the 20th uh, of October and will be, have been discussed on the fourth uh, stakeholder assembly and will be up for, uh, for, for a discussion and vote actually at the constitutive uh, assembly. So you can decide if you agree with that or not. And with that, I will stop at this point and hand over, I think, back to you, Martin. Yes, thank you, Stefan. I think that now it's time to summarize what's in it for Polish universities. What are the main important things? I would say that uh, on the basis of what has been said here is that uh, the joining the coalition is uh, the perfect way of for being in contact with uh, other peers from different countries to uh, be able to discuss the good, uh, good practices, to look together to the solutions of uh, various problems that are abundant in the European uh, higher education systems, and uh, to have also the possibility to look at Polish uh, way of assessing uh, the research from more international perspective, knowing how the things are done in the different countries. Uh, it is, uh, I know that everyone has some contacts uh, with different uh, countries, with universities in different systems, but uh, participation in the coalition gives a possibility to see it in all its complexity. And uh, I can say that, uh, first of all, Poland is a quite a big uh, system, higher education system in Europe, as far as the number of uh, institutions are concerned. It is uh, probably not most complicated, but also not most simple system, as far as the, its regulation is concerned. But it means that uh, we can uh, discuss with many uh, people from different countries how they are able to cope with challenges coming from the from the from the, the system they are uh, they are part of but it's uh, also the question of having an impact the we have said here that uh, the change of, in the research assessment it's not something that could happen just in poland in the in disconnected from europe and not in europe disconnected from the end of the uh, rest of the world so to have an impact there must be a significant large community that pursues these goals and uh, it has to have a sufficient critical mass the Participation in the coalition and participation in this project um, makes a better chance for it to be successful. Staying uh, away and looking how it will develop, it uh, will be uh, something like uh, decreasing the chance for the success. So what I would say with this is that uh, together we are much stronger and uh, if the critical mass is reached, it can really impact the way how the research assessment is seen in the coming years, also worldwide. And this, uh, what uh, Stefan has quoted, uh, the, um, for example, the stopping of the uh, of the 
assessment in Australia and also it has been quoted yesterday in the New Zealand, it also has been stopped, is a uh, sign that in many countries, even outside of Europe, people are looking into this exercise and are interested what how it will develop and are not uh, waiting for, 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 the, for the outcome. So they believe it is important and it can bring the change. Uh, inside the coalition, it is important that uh, universities have a strong uh, representation. Why? There are already many of the funding agencies that uh, have joined the coalition or are about to join. The maintaining the right proportion between the universities, research institutes, funders and governmental organization is vital because we need to have uh, uh, our perspective has to be supported by the right possibilities to uh, make the decision, set the agenda. And uh, it seems that uh, it will be quite important to, uh, to have the much larger group of the universities than it is uh, now. Also, as also I will refer to what Stefan said, what you see on the slides are the situation from a week ago, because the procedure for uh, making the list of signatories requires verification on the, on the way, and it takes some time. So there are more of them, but still uh, much more of them would be would would bring the uh, gravity to the uh, to the uh, coalition. And uh, it, uh, what I would like to also say is that uh, we are very often uh, looking from the very local perspective on the research assessment and. Uh, this, uh, with our discussions also during the lunch, we see that there are many challenges. It is easier to cope with challenges if there is sufficient collective wisdom in to, to, uh, to answer these challenges. And I believe that coalition is the form of this collective wisdom that could be used very efficiently and very successfully. So, Coming to the very short uh, summary, universities need to bring a change and uh, first of all, it is necessary that uh, they are actively involved in the research assessment change. It is important that uh, the decisions are made with the full consciousness and full commitment to, to, this, uh, to this process. And uh, the representation of the universities must be big enough to uh, accommodate for the different perspectives because of the countries they come, because of the institutional profiles, because of disciplines and everything. So we need to have uh, a broad perspectives and that me it means that we need the, the diversity inside this university group and inside the uh, coalition. And uh, finally, uh, it is uh, important that the universities are the largest group of members of the coalition because most of the research assessment, it is the job of universities and academics in the universities. So, having said that, and asking you for the uh, for making inform, uh, informed choice choices, uh, I should also point out what are the advantages of uh, signing on early. Please remember that the deadline for signing, so that institutions can take place, can take, can participate in the um, in the constitutive assembly is. 17th of November, it's two and a half week from now. And uh, the main, the main uh, advantages of early signing on means that institutions that did so 
uh, had the influence on the governance documents, uh, rules of procedures, code of contacts, and all the uh, organizational framework of the coalition. Then uh, they have the possibility to elect the, elect the steering board and also put the uh, candidates to the steering board. And uh, they can decide uh, on the secretariat of the coalition, which will be very, uh, very needed for, for, um, uh, for oper normal operation, and decide on the funding model. So they would be those institutions that really shape the coalition. It is possible to join later on, but then to join the coalition, which is already shaped and decided. And uh, of course, it could be it could be changed afterwards, but there is a clear advantage to be in this process already from the beginning. And uh, last but not least, uh, the say on what would will be the uh, working groups that and those working groups are the main operational form of the coalition and uh, its results. So once again, you can see here the address where you can sign the agreement. Uh, it is also possible to find all the drafts of the documents uh, on the Quara, uh, on the Quara uh, website. And uh, as a just a final statement uh, in this. I would say that uh, in the UA, in the workshop organized by UA yesterday on the uh, on the travel toward the uh, the coalition, there was a kind of exercise. The people, the participants, were asked to uh, give an answer to the question: What is for you the coalition? if you would like to use one word. And the uh, word cloud has been created. It was for me, but I think also for many people involved in this process, a very interesting outcome. The word that has been chosen was fairness. And uh, fairness means that we believe that the things can be made more fair than it is now, and this is the right way to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. And now it's time uh, to move to the second open floor questions and answers. And uh, we also start with uh, our audience, our participants in presence. So please ask questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ask question, Professor. Yeah. If you have questions, just ask. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I uh, we discussed, uh, of course, during the networking uh, uh, lunch break. I like the work to stress the work networking uh, because it was networking lunch. But I think what is extremely important for uh, potential uh, participants uh, of the coalition is the networking of the universities and the research institutions to work on better, more efficient, more reliable and sustainable uh, evaluation. We know that uh, changes in um, approaches to evaluation um, are not good for the universities. Uh, I think institutions like, like ours uh, need kind of stability because uh, having a um, graduate takes us uh, at the medical university seven years. So if we change the rules, if we change uh, the approach within short period of time, it's not good, it's not uh, guaranteeing uh, our um, responsibility also in front of our collaborators, etc. Therefore, uh, my question, my question is, how do you plan to achieve sustainability without budget? The question is, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, very important, 
because if we want to achieve all of these goals, which are fantastic, and I am fully agree, I am fully with you, I think that it's it's not something that will appear like that. You need uh, you need structure, you need um, regular meetings, uh, you need contacts, and therefore for this for this webinars uh, conferences you need you need funding. Therefore, my question is: um, Is the coalition li liable for? Uh, accessing uh, horizon money or EU money to get support and to do more. So happy to answer that one. Uh, absolutely. So um, it is already known from the draft uh, work program that uh, there is a wide error call that is targeting exactly the, the, the coalition. Uh, it is 5 million euros for three years which will include 2.5 million uh, for the Secretariat specifically, and then the other 2.5 million will be grant, uh, cascade grants, so for example, to go to working groups or to go to workshops to be organized for, uh, for some of the members who would like to do specific research or activities uh, on the work of the coalition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that call has a deadline uh, in March of next year, which means that from March, whoever gets it will be able to retroactively uh, get money for the Secretariat and therefore for the activities of the coalition, which means we have a gap between now, 1st of December, and March. So the Secretariat that has been se selected, the interim Secretariat that has been selected for now, which is the European Science Foundation, has uh, agreed to give in kind for a bit more than 40,000 uh, euros for the moment. But we are looking for other sources of money. And we know for a fact that there's, uh, in France, for example, going to be some money also coming and some other funders might come in. That said, we have a gap. And that's why what we will likely do on the 1st of December is also launch a new call for in kind uh, contribution by members on specific tasks. To be able to, to achieve the work plan, there are things that the interim secretary will be able to do, but not only. And so there, I think there will be specific ways to help. Another way to help is, for example, for those members who will want to be running uh, some of the working groups to contribute in kind. So seconding staff, hard time, part of their time, to be able to uh, actually run some of the working groups. So those are examples of ways that we can we can close the gap. Then, of course, uh, the wide area call will come in, and we do hope that within Europe, but also outside Europe, uh, some of the uh, some of the funders and others out there uh, will be uh, putting in money. And of course, as I said earlier, if your university wants to put in some money, some cash, we will be welcoming that very much. <laughs> That many, uni that many universities will be interested in. So I, uh, I, I, I strongly suggest to, to, to share this information, maybe not detailed, but just to say that this and that and that, because universities, if they want to be not only partners, but also, let's say, active participants, they have to uh, think about uh, possibilities they have. And... Uh, uh, also, uh, both uh, human resources, but also financial res financial resources. So that's quite fair to tell them that this is the way it's going to function. Yeah, and and just so that it, just to be very clear, the wide air call uh, has been known because it's it's uh, it's been in in in, in the drafts. But it's true we're not making that uh, you know a, a big thing because I think that we don't want to rely only on the European Commission's money. We will be wanting to have a diversity. No, 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 it's fine. No, 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 but. In general, I think it's very important to know what is this scheme of. Yeah, yeah. Of the European Commission and what it has to be sustainable, reliable. Yeah, of course. And, and but that said, I would like to insist that the wide error call will be a competitive call. Huh? So I'm sure there will be a consortium put together. Uh, probably by the interim secretariat 
that will be put in place, but others can, can go and compete for this. And whoever gets it will somewhat uh, become the secretary of the, of the coalition. EUA itself will not take part of, in that call. We feel conflicted because, of course, we've been part of the process so far. So it would be a bit strange if we were to be part of the, uh, the call. But of course, other you know, universities out there would be welcome to join the consortium or put a consortium together. Thank you very much for this uh, for this answer. Another questions? Don't be shy. Don't be. Ah, okay. Please. I I would like to uh, point out one uh, thing that I have actually uh, forgotten to say uh, during this uh, part on what's in for Polish universities. And this is uh, the role of the coalition as a leverage for discussing the legal framework in Poland. Because uh, it, we know from experience that uh, the mm, possibility to show that uh, some processes are more general European or global processes uh, helps making our legislators the decisions that follows these uh, processes. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize this aspect of joining the coalition as well and the possibility how to use this coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Very important uh, one. Uh, please, Professor Horbaczewska, Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Computer, Computer Science. Uh, I would like to ask if you plan any monitoring on the process uh, progress that members of uh, of this agreement make individually towards implementing the agreement. The answer is no, and simply because the stakeholders didn't want that, and I can understand why. It is back to the uh, importance of the autonomy. As I as, as I said earlier, I think that. The, the, the monitoring will be self-assessment. It will be through your reporting on the progress you have made to the coalition that the monitoring will, will be made in a sense, because it's gonna be, uh, as I said, morally binding. Other members of the coalition will be expecting to see your university, if you have signed, uh, making progress towards the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the reform. That said, as I insisted, it will only be based on self-assessment and there will be no benchmarking between any, organ any organization. And importantly also uh, to note here is that um, the COARA itself will need to self-reflect. COARA will need to monitor its own progress as a coalition. So not looking at individual, but I think it will be important for its progress to be able to, on a yearly basis probably, assess where it's going. And if you think, for example, of Plan S right now, well, where is Plan S today? What progress have they been able to achieve uh, in, in the, when was it started, 2021? I, uh, no, sorry, earlier. Uh, and they have an end goal of 2024. So I think that they're, they, they're doing this assessment. Well, same thing will, need, will be needed also within the coalition, but again, not on an institutional basis, but more on the coalition basis uh, for, for in this case. Thank you very much. We have time for maybe one question from our audience. If not, we have, I suppose, sorry? Yeah. Yes, of course, sorry, always. It's to you. Of uh, uh, participants from different countries, but I have, I don't remember what is the situation with British uh, universities. <laughs> Sorry for that. So British universities has one university, and that's Swansea. Uh, and Swansea uh, University, Swansea is actually the university. Uh, the vice chancellor is also the vice president of uh, uh, EUA. Uh, the, the, it's the only organization this, that this has was this was the direction of my question. 
So uh, what's happening in the UK, from what I understand, is that they are very much, well, they have their own troubles right now, which is called Brexit and some political turmoil. And they are in a big unknown. Not just that. What's happened also is that they've just finished with the ref and they're in process of reviewing the ref. And um, some are seeing this as an opportunity, but then potentially also a, a double exercise. So what we have, and I'm quite curious to have that, we're going to have a similar workshop as this one with uh, U, uh, universities UK uh, in two weeks from now. And I'm quite curious to see first how many British universities will be participating, and second, uh, what will be their questions, concerns, etc. Because I think that, yes, it's important to have the UK also on board. Um, and if you want to mention another country for which I'm concerned, Germany. Uh, Germany right now is also asking itself a lot of questions about this reform. In Germany, I understand, but uh, I think that uh, part of our evaluation uh, co concept of the Polish uh, national evaluation was based on the evaluation uh, taking place uh, at the British universities, you know, with, the, with this expert part and two different pillars uh, evaluating, uh, evaluating uh, let's say, papers or uh, scientific achievements via, via the published results. Uh, therefore, uh, the system, uh, to some, to, to, to quite high extent, is very similar in very, in several um, British British universities, also. I do think that sometimes it's quite unfortunate, but some uh, in in uh, well performing, and I'm, I don't mean uh, research intense countries, but what I mean is some countries are far ahead, and there were even questions sometimes: Why do we need to do this? Because we're there already. And so it, it needs convincing the other way around here. And that is, we are going to the Netherlands and there all the, the Dutch universities, the funder and the National Rectors Conference and the Academy have signed on. Same thing will happen in Norway, it's just a bit delayed. I think there's more convincing to be done in the UK because we would clearly benefit within the coalition of the experience of, of, of the UK universities and UK institutions in general. So I hope that we, we will get more, uh, more of them to join also. But at least now they have a, you know, their sixth prime minister in what, three years? Hopefully it will stabilize a little bit and they can start looking at the future, even though the whole UK association to the Horizon Europe is still on their mind. We'll be discussing this uh, on, on, on Friday at the uh, EUA Council also. Oh. And just to be clear, Switzerland, the Swiss universities have signed. So at least for Switzerland, they're on board. <laughs> okay, so we know who is on board uh, in the coalition. And now, any questions from, from our um, audience present? No, so we are, we are waiting for the question from question box from our participants who are online, please. What will be the legal status of the coalition? It will be an association. Does it mean that the coalition will be a non-governmental organization? So for now, we've decided not to create um, a legal status, and we leave the decision actually to the um, to the uh, coalition. Uh, at this stage, to be honest, uh, the whole process is something we didn't want to get involved into. There's a lot of legal uh, work to be done. Uh, writing up the statutes, etc. I do believe that at some point uh, it will be uh, to be considered by the uh, the General Assembly. That's why we do foresee, for example, in the first year to have three meetings of the General Assembly rather than just one. Uh, so at this stage, there will there will not be a legal status. That said, the interim secretariat or the secretariat will have to have one just to be able to receive the money and manage the money that uh, funders, for example, will be providing to it. So that is something that uh, I'm sure will be considered at the early stage of the coalition once, once it's established. There is no other questions. So I think if there is no one from our audience, I look at you. If not, uh, it's time for final remarks or maybe comments from our keynote speakers, if you have some. 
Yes, we have. Well, I think that uh, it is. Uh, it has been a very interesting discussion because uh, as with the coalition we need to uh, understand all different perspectives and different views on it so i'm very happy that we could uh, we could uh, discuss it and uh, also during the lunch break uh, i think we have had interesting uh, interesting um, exchange of views um, i'm I'm not happy that we couldn't uh, bring all the people together here in the room so that the part of our uh, audience is online, but uh, it is uh, still the, uh, something to do in the future to continue this type of discussions, perhaps already in the, uh, in the, the form of the coalition or the groups in coalition, but uh, it would be nice to have uh, to, to see uh, all different variety of institutions here. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers, to the University of Łódź, to uh, Director Zanzinska and to uh, Kasia Riley for, uh, and uh, the whole team for, for uh, making this meeting uh, possible. And uh, that uh, is... Uh, also a good opportunity to say bring the message forth what you have heard here in your universities in your institutions and to your friends remember the deadline uh, of 17 november and uh, if you are in doubt with uh, something do not hesitate to ask us to uh, read the documents the read the frequent ask questions section on the CoARA website and we will be very happy to uh, either give the answers or direct you to the source where you can get the, this additional knowledge. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity to meet you all. Thank you. <laughs> and final remarks from Stefan, please. I mean, nothing, nothing much to add. I think you've said it all. Uh, please, if you have any more question and process within your universities, feel free to reach out. I hope that today we've started providing you the information so that you can make an informed decision about signing or not the, uh, the agreement and joining the uh, coalition. We will be providing, of course, the PowerPoint. As Martin just mentioned, please go and use the, uh, the Coara website as a resource. As he mentioned, there's a, an, an FAQ in there that answers a lot of questions, and we will keep updating uh, the FAQ with new questions. So don't hesitate to, on the website, but also to us at EUA, come and ask questions. And you can do that directly to us. You can do that to, uh, to, um, with, uh, with, uh, you know, through CRAS, more, more than welcome. The only thing I can say is I do hope to see you to see many of you on the 1st of December uh, as members of the coalition uh, and to count on uh, Polish universities to uh, to uh, help us in this uh, in this journey and in this reform that uh, will be I'm convinced of huge benefit for uh, for all university and, and the whole university sector. So let me let me finish by thanking you all for being either here in the room, for being there online and listening to us. Thank you very much uh, to CRASP, of course, for uh, agreeing to organize this uh, with us. Thanks to uh, Martin for, uh, for agreeing to be uh, the national champion uh, also on, 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 on this, uh, this workshop. And of course, thank you very much to you and your university for uh, hosting us here today. It was a pleasure to be here today in Poland. I only wish that well, actually, now we'll have a bit of time to enjoy the sun outside. So thank you very much and see you soon on the 1st of December uh, in the coalition. Thank you. So thank you, our excellent keynote speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you once again. <laughs>